She's a professor of history in the Faculty of Humanities and Social Sciences at the Cooper Union in New York City. She has published quite broadly, um, and her publications include Jews, Germans, and Allies, Close Encounters in Occupied Germany. Uh, she's published Reforming Sex, the German Movement for Birth Control and Abortion Reform, which was published in 1995. She's co-edited volumes on crimes of war, guilt, and denial in the 20th century, uh, after the Nazi racial state difference in democracy in Germany and Europe, as well as more recently, Shelter from the Holocaust, Rethinking Jewish Survival in the Soviet Union, and most recently, a book that uh, we co-edited together on the history of the Joint Distribution Committee it's called the JDC at 100, uh, essays on the 100th anniversary of the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee. There's more, and there are many honors and fellowships, but I think she would tell me that's enough. So uh, it's a pleasure for me to welcome Athena Grossman. Thank you. 
in the displaced persons camps of post-war occupied Europe. So that's one part of the story that will come into the picture uh, somewhere uh, in the middle of this talk. Uh, and on the other hand, the story, as I said, that usually gets told uh, quite separately, uh, the flight from uh, comfortable, bourgeois, central European homes. In this case, this is actually my paternal grandfather's living room uh, in, uh, in uh, Friedenau in Berlin, uh, so quite comfortable, as you see, uh, to sites of refuge uh, that we might think of as exotic, non-European spaces uh, all over the globe. In this case, uh, the story of Iran and India, uh, where German-speaking Jews ended up. And so there's a point at which these two histories that are, are usually understood separately will come together, and they will actually come together in Iran and in India. Uh, it's a story that uh, also speaks very much to the history of, of Zionism, the history of the establishment of, of, 
this new work is doing is trying to integrate this, with the notion of global transit, as it has been called, of variable durations, uh, sometimes only a few months, sometimes years, in some cases lifetimes, uh, but usually uh, temporary, uh, to sort of integrate both of these stories more firmly into both histories of the Holocaust and also empire and its fracture. And uh, then maybe uh, most importantly for the uh, next uh, half hour or so, uh, it's also a uh, personal story uh, for me because it uh, turned out, I didn't really know this when I started my research on Polish Jews in the, uh, in the Soviet Union, because my parents, after all, came from Berlin. Uh, but it's a kind of family memoir uh, that is based on a lot of family archives, as well as uh, letters and memorabilia, and not just from them, but from their friends, and sort of it's turning into a really a uh, collection of letters and telegrams uh, and objects from almost everywhere in the world. Uh, these people who happen to be my parents, but I like to think that I would have found them interesting sources, even if they were not, um, are, uh, uh, as they said, never would have intersected, never would have met at home, even though they both came from Berlin, they came from quite different worlds, uh, but they met uh, in Tehran as refugees in the 1930s. Uh, this is uh, a table with sort of those of you who know about assembly or read it. Well, the coffee and Kuchen table. Uh, it's actually a photo from 1938. It's the last photo that we have of um, my paternal family together. Uh, I'll say something more about that in a moment. Uh, they met only in Tehran. Uh, they remained always a rather unlikely pair. A uh, relationship that developed against this sort of dual backdrop of an emerging European catastrophe. This is 1938. This is right before the Spanish, uh, which we are commemorating uh, in a very few days. Um, and, and their very paradoxical experience I would almost say excruciatingly ambivalent experience as uprooted refugee Jews who also found not just shelter but also adventure and in some cases pleasure as well as trauma in their destinations. Um, they were on the one hand homeless, displaced, they had lost livelihoods, professions, they had little to no sense of their family's fate um, or what the future held for them. And um, as you know, I'm, uh, probably uh, the, the fates that befall these people uh, are those that befell most German Jews, which is that the younger generation uh, manages to escape uh, and the older generation um, is murdered. And I would just point out that the, the guy up, sitting up at the left um, is a Walter Grossman who becomes uh, a physician uh, in Hartford, Connecticut, uh, living at 34 Canterbury Street in Hartford, uh, a place that I came to know very well when I was a child. Uh, and uh, along, with, he was a, along with his wife, uh, who's sitting right there, uh, who was a pediatrician but not able to continue working uh, as such once she came to the United States. She's actually sitting next to my father. My mother is not in the photo because they live in different worlds, as I said. Um, so they are, they end up uh, both as refugees, but these kind of oddly privileged uh, adventurers in colonial and semi-colonial societies. And in certain ways, um, I would say, <coughs> the permit that my father received uh, to enter Tehran for the first time, uh, already in the mid-30s. That photo is from later. He manages to go back and forth several times. Uh, in some ways, they, they were, I think, maybe charismatic in their motivation for ending up where they did, because uh, 
my father was what you might call a Zalon communist, um, someone who never officially joined the party, but he was a young, brash lawyer. He worked for the um, Communist Legal Aid Association. He was someone who uh, needed to escape uh, Nazi Germany very quickly, not because he was Jewish initially, uh, but because of his political affiliation, and who just happened, and these I think are always the stories that once we enter into individual histories or family histories, we find out how much is idiosyncratic, how much is individual, personal, and how difficult it is at times to link that to a larger, a larger tale that as historians we want to tell. So it just so happened that Berlin at the time, uh, uh, still in the Weimar Republic, was of course a very cosmopolitan European center, and he had met up with an Armenian woman uh, who just happened to have family in Tehran. In fact, she is in that photo um, right up next to Walter. Uh, and it was because of her that when he needed to leave in a great hurry, uh, that she simply said, okay, we are going to go visit my parents in Tehran. And that was how this uh, entry permit was uh, acquired. Um, the story was quite different uh, for my mother, and I think that's, a, that's why I say paradigmatic. Um, she was younger. Uh, she was working at, in the family pharmacy. That was part of how she was able to enter Iran as someone who would contribute to the development of a nation-building state, uh, modern Persia and then Iran. Um, but she was someone who, in the tradition, one might say, of a certain kind of German-Jewish Orientalism, about which a great deal has been written, um, was fascinated in a scholarly, uh, as well as a uh, the personal uh, way, by, uh, by the Orient. Um, she would have liked to study uh, that field at the Humboldt University. She no longer could do that because, of, because she was Jewish. Um, but she hung out uh, with Persian students at the university. She already was learning um, Farsi uh, and uh, actually was, had always dreamt of going to Persia. Uh, and, and so that, in a sense, her flight was driven by Nazism, was driven by persecution, but was also, in a way, uh, as she would later say, with a certain amount of chagrin and guilt, uh, it, was, it also offered her an opportunity that she otherwise might not have been able uh, to take. That was certainly not the case for this accidental refugee. Uh, my father, um, who uh, surely would have preferred to go west, would have preferred to go to the United States, um, but couldn't in the rush, and also maybe because of his political affiliation, but always insisted that the Orient was, as he said, I know what to say it in German, kein Ort für ein Berliner Rechtsanwalt, no place for a Berlin lawyer. Uh, and that was probably more the feeling that many of these European refugees actually had. And I think of this photo as being really, uh, again, very indicative of that. Some of you may know the expression, many of you won't. Uh, there's an expression called Yekka, lots of discussions about uh, where that uh, word comes from. Uh, the, but it was a term that was both uh, derogatory, but also sometimes um, sarcastically self-adapted by the people against whom it was used, uh, which talks about German Jews as being very proper and always wearing jackets. And I always think this is like the cover for a book about this, because there he is in the middle of the desert, uh, wearing a suit and a tie and having himself photographed. I have no idea why or who took the photo, but um, there, uh, there he is. Uh, so it's, uh, it's really in that context, as I say, that I found um, all of these uh, these photographs. I, I think my, uh, you can get a sense here of someone who really wanted to be part of being in the desert, uh, if you look at uh, this photograph of my mother. 
as another refugee, uh, we saw a, a refugee pediatrician that she ended up in Berkeley, California. Uh, we are all uprooted and put down in this utterly alien culture. And to most refugees, it did seem alien. It did Um, and that is actually 
a gender specific aspect that really requires uh, more attention. Uh, these refugees uh, were quite varied uh, in where they came from, also in the degree to which they identified uh, with being Jewish. But one thing that we can say is that they lived in a uh, multicultural enclave that was, for the most part, not well integrated with their host society, which itself was very multicultural. It was not only certainly Muslim Iranian, there were many Zoroastrians, there were Armenian Christians, there were Russians. Uh, this was uh, a society we tend to forget, um, also uh, significantly composed of minorities and also of local uh, Iranian per uh, uh, Persian Jews. Uh, the sort of close personal contacts, uh, including, and that's another story we could spend more time on, um, including with the, if you will, indigenous uh, Persian Jews uh, were very frequent and constant and regular and every day, uh, but usually they had to do with encounters with domestic servants, with drivers, with landlords who very often were Jews, with sometimes with medical professionals, pharmacists. One place where uh, refugees uh, and uh, locals, and particularly local Jews, met. Uh, this is, by the way, my mother's notebook uh, that has where she's practicing her Farsi, um, and it has a portrait of the crown prince who will become the Shah in 1941. Um, and as you see um, in her notebook where she's practicing uh, her Farsi, and uh, the, the, the language that she knows is French, that is the language that all Europeans tended to speak in common, French, not English. And the place where they did gather, interestingly, was at the, um, in the reading room, I think this is where she was practicing, uh, the reading room of an organization called the Alliance Israelite Universelle, which had already been founded at the end of the 19th century um, as um, an aid association for uh, Jews living, for, for essentially for Mizrahi Jews uh, outside of Europe. Um, and this was a place that attracted both Persian and European Jews. It was also an important conduit for the JDC, for the Joint Distribution <coughs> Committee, um, and also then for emissaries from Palestine uh, from, the, from, the Jewish, uh, from the Jewish agency. Uh, so people had to sort of straddle uh, both worlds to more or less of a degree whether it was as in uh, the, 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 the case that I know best. Um, on the one hand, having an official position uh, at the <coughs> Ministry of Justice, actually helping to write this new constitution in the mid-1930s, um, but also working in the bazaar, traveling in that survival trade of many refugees, of many displaced, the import-export world, as we call it. Uh, and, uh, and then there were those uh, who really lived almost entirely within, within their own enclave. But uh, they were, and this is, I think, a, ge a general point that I would make, they were stranded in precarious safety on the margins of what they n knew but didn't fully understand to be a collapsing and devastated Jewish-European world. So they lived as hybrids. This is a passport only very belatedly stamped with a J because as it turned out, the German mission in Tehran was very divided in its loyalties and in fact, um, un almost <coughs> until uh, the invasion drove them out in 1941, the invasion by the British and the Soviets were not actually stamping uh, Jews' passports and were renewing them every year, but at the very end, uh, they, 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 they were stamped, um, but they, they lived as hybrids. As in this case, they were stateless, but they still had this German uh, passport that was marked then with a Jew, uh, with, with, as, that they were Jews. Um, and they, so in that sense, they, they were simultaneously, what if you will, immigrants, expats, and refugees. 
and they will court more or less comfortably between this world of the colonizer or the occupier by 1941 and the colonized or those who were semi, uh, semi-colonized. They were, and I just want to, because we want to make some general points here, uh, they were uh, in flight from places that they had known as home uh, that had condemned them, right, as racially inferior. But at the same time as Europeans, they carried with them a kind of fraught sense of racialized cultural superiority. So they had been driven out of Europe by one form of racism. Uh, and here I think maybe you can sort of see this is actually the last photograph of um, my father and his mother, who would eventually be deported. Uh, and I think, you know, I mean, you get a sense of the fear and the anxiety and um, the increasing panic of, of, of European Jews. So they, they, they've driven out by one form of racism, but now they encountered and to some degree benefited from this colonial form of hierarchy in which they occupied a peculiar in-between position. Um, they had been expelled from the West. They never really left behind. Uh, they continued to go to their cabarets, their chamber music concerts. Uh, to uh, meet each other uh, in, uh, in, in boarding houses or in the homes of those who had acquired a certain amount of security and wealth, often physicians. Uh, and but they never really relinquished the dream of returning to the world they had lost or at least a new version of past homes in which they would be welcome. Because, and this is actually a photo of the building that uh, had belonged to uh, the family uh, after it was Aryanized and it became a hotel, uh, they knew that that world was gone. And I think it's an important point to make because we always talk, we often talk about the nostalgia, especially of German Jews, since we're talking today about Kristallnacht, um, for the world that they had lost. But I think that it's important to understand that they knew that this was a nostalgia for a world that was forever destroyed. That it was a place to which they could never go back. That it had been taken away. It had new names. It had not, it had not survived. And maybe even more painfully and increasingly with time, they understood that even those memories, even the memories that they would carry with them, would always be contaminated by the knowledge of what had happened. So that there, was, there were no longer any innocent memories of what might have been a very happy and seemingly secure youth. Um, as another refugee wrote um, to a, a relative left behind, um, already in the late 1930s, he says, the newspaper reports have at least one good effect I no longer suffer from any homesickness. This was an assertion that was both only partly accurate and more and more potent over time. So it was, in some ways, a good life. Here we see the excursions into the desert on motorcycles with the sidecar motorcycles that, by the way, were produced by German companies that had been extremely active uh, in Iran uh, really throughout the 20th century and continue to be until uh, 1941. Um, they, so if I go through this archive of ephemera, of memorabilia, um, I find, for example, the ad from the German-Persian Chamber of Commerce advertising uh, the motorcycle. Uh, that becomes so popular. Uh, but it was one, as I said, of music programs with a classical European repertoire, <coughs> amateur cabarets, light opera, many well-worn English paperbacks that had been brought by missionaries, by uh, British uh, officials, and then later by, uh, by the military. Uh, they went to the cinema, which had become extremely <coughs> popular uh, in Iran under the modernizing shop. Uh, seeing everything from Charlie Chaplin's 
uh, movies to Harold Lloyd to Maurice Chevalier to uh, German costume dramas that were still coming in uh, from Nazi uh, Berlin. Uh, so it was a life that uh, included skiing in the mountains, uh, the famous uh, resort for where Europeans went, and also many middle-class Iranians. I actually have a photo from a friend, colleague of his parents, uh, who were uh, native Iranians, which is uh, quite, um, quite, quite similar um, here again. Just quickly going just um, here, maybe a little bit of Weimar, uh, Weimar physical fitness uh, in the middle of, uh, of course, what was a deserted, uh, a deserted road uh, with very few cars. Uh, it was, in that sense, a surprisingly good life, but it was always punctuated by the news that filtered in. Uh, that filtered in in part by copies of, that, that's my warning sign, um, <laughs> and I, I just want to say something about India, um, that we have, that's only one picture. Um, the, uh, uh, that came in in part by uh, newspapers that were sent from Hartford, Connecticut after uh, 1938, uh, but the Reader's Digest, and the transnational German Jewish refugee journal called the Aufbau, uh, which carried which carried news and which was read around the world, whether in Tehran or Shanghai or Buenos Aires or, as I'll say in a moment, uh, in British internment camps uh, or, um, in this case, uh, in Tehran. Um, but also, still news that came with letters, carefully coded letters. Uh, but that didn't really say what was going on in Berlin. And then, of course, ultimately, most ominously, letters that never anymore arrived uh, and could no longer be picked up at the post restante at uh, the, the, the main Tehran post office, which, was such a, which became a very important site for people actually uh, to gather. So uh, thin indeed was the ice on which we were skating in wartime uh, Iraq, in Iran, or another refugee. Uh, this was a place that became even more uh, multinational and multicultural uh, after the invasion, uh, because until the summer of 1941, Iran's adherents quickly declared on September 4th, 1939, to what the British envoy, with typical scorn, described as a manic neutrality um, it did allow for significant pro-German activity. This is a photo of the old Shah who was deposed because of suspicions of being too close uh, to the Germans, in part. Um, there were brown houses set up by local <coughs> Nazi affiliates. Uh, there were, and these are the reports, there's the very detailed reports by British political residents that are extraordinary <coughs> sources of information. Uh, very, very precise propaganda that glared from loudspeakers in squares, in, um, in, in multiple uh, towns, and, uh, and, and in the capital. There were Persian language broadcasts that came uh, from Berlin. Uh, there was reason, certainly, uh, for anxiety. But what's curious to me is that in the correspondence that I read from the refugees, and again, not just my own family, uh, that piece is remarkably absent. It is much more the story of these pleasures, the pleasures of urban life uh, 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 in Tehran, the cabarets, the cafes, the films, but also this kind of the indig indignities of adapting to the audience. So people are writing all the time about their stomach troubles, right? About the lateness of, their, of the drivers, about uh, minor shortages. And then they would gather in cafes, restaurants, in the more western areas of the town. So we hear about <coughs> drinking vodka and eating caviar and dancing on tables until 3 a.m. at cafes uh, on, the, uh, on, on the avenue uh, La Desar, for example. And that is what, where they went sightseeing, they went skiing, 
Uh, they went swimming in the Caspian. They meandered through the bazaar. Uh, and interestingly, all of this is still reported back uh, to Berlin with a kind of remarkable lack of self-consciousness um, until it is no longer possible uh, to do that. And the fears of war uh, loom. Uh, and uh, there is anxiety about the loss of uh, travel routes out of the country and also the loss of these precious coastal routes. Uh, so with that then comes the arrival of war and occupation in August 1941. It was deeply unpopular with the Iranians, but it was for the refugees in a sense a boom. The arrival particularly of the Americans uh, and the British uh, and there's a great deal more I would love to say about that because Iran turns out to be, of course, we all know about the uh, winter 1943 Tehran conference, but starting in uh, uh, August, the summer of 1941, Iran becomes one of the most important, probably in some ways the most important, non-combat theater of the Second World War. Um, after the division of this uh, young monarchy and the, and the installation of the new uh, Shah as a titular leader, uh, a leader uh, because Roosevelt orders the formation, even though they're not formal occupiers, of what would become the Persian Gulf Command. Interestingly, under the uh, leadership of none other than General Norman Schwarzkopf Sr., those of you who know about the history of, remember the history of the Iraq Wars, um, that was also uh, a, uh, a command post. That was his son. And this was an Allied supply operation. We know about it because of Lend-Lease, the Allied lifeline of supplies to the Soviet Union that helped the Soviet Union fight, uh, fight the Germans. Brought some 30,000 US troops Almost many, many of them, almost all of the non-commissioned soldiers were African American because it was a non-combat mission. A fascinating story. Um, thousands of civilian workers, they built in Iran something like uh, 200,000 trucks, 5,000 planes. The British brought their colonial troops. The British brought, brought uh, mostly Indian troops. Um, <coughs> Iran becomes this kind of epicenter of the war effort and also a confrontation with the ravages of war, <coughs> with the arrival with this Andres army. Here you see just very quickly some of the uh, Jewish soldiers. These are all medical personnel who are getting on the trains uh, with the Polish <coughs> exile army from Uzbekistan uh, to Iran. Um, here you see two Polish nurses, one is Jewish, one is not, who come with the um, who come with this army to Iran. Uh, so it, it is a center for a war effort, but it's also a center, and I just want to quickly flag this, of a kind of confrontation with what is one of the first obvious, because the Americans and the British and the <coughs> Soviets are not in the ghettos of Poland. They are not standing uh, in the death camps. But what they do see are the arrival of these emaciated, traumatized Polish refugees coming from the Soviet Union. Uh, and it's a real geopolitical dilemma for the Allies because they have to navigate what is now a virulent anti-communism on the part of Polish refugees, especially the non-Jewish ones, and the commitment to supporting the Soviets in the war effort and the fact that the British are really competing with the Americans and the Soviets for control of Iran. And indeed, as is very explicit, uh, their oil. Uh, and it is telling that when the American um, Red Cross representative in Cairo is quickly summoned uh, to Tehran to deal with the influx of refugees that came with this, as I said, over 115,000 or so Polish soldiers and something like a thousand Jewish children, but also non-Jewish children. He is so shocked, this envoy from Cairo is so shocked that he talks about 
the children, here they are in, these are Jewish children in their transit camps. These are the children that will be called the Tehran children. He calls them haunting shadows, walking skeletons. And he says, this is an awful holocaust with a small h. He's writing uh, in the summer of 1942. So they are confronting war via what they see happening in the Soviet Union. Uh, so there's a, a great deal to be said about this place, Iran, as a center of the war effort. Uh, very crucial. But I'm going to turn now very quickly, these are the children again, uh, to the other site, uh, which uh, is linked in a way uh, with what is happening in Iran and also what is happening uh, with the efforts of the Americans uh, in Iran and the Joint Distribution Committee. This is one of my favorite sources, so I had to put it in quickly. Uh, uh, a postcard that comes from Siberia still, addressed simply to the American Joint Distribution Committee, Tehran, Iran. And it comes from the Soviet Union, as you see, and it arrives, it arrives. It's in the files, in the JDC files. And on the back, it simply says, it's April 44th, quite late. Thank you for the matzo. In fact, there are packages being sent that contain, of course, much more than matzo. Tea, rice, sugar, anything that can be used on the black market. Um, some of those goods are being shipped by another international Jewish relief agency operating out of colonial British, um, British India, the Jewish Relief Association um, of Bombay, who are also collecting items to be sent uh, actually to Tehran and then from Tehran uh, to, uh, 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 in, into the Soviet Union. Uh, so the story shifts, five minutes, the story shifts uh, with my sources to India, although we have already about 6,000 more or less, we don't know exactly, uh, Axis country, that is uh, Germany, Italy, and Austria, uh, Jewish refugees in India. We don't know exactly how many who have already arrived in the 1930s. By 1939, when the war starts uh, in Europe, they become enemy aliens. Uh, many of them are interned. Many of them are actually over time released. By the time my father's story goes on, May 1941, when he's finally trying to get uh, to the United States, thanks to everything that one needed at the time, an affidavit from his brother, who by now is a very respected physician in Hartford on Canterbury Street. Um, he has an affidavit, he has a valid transit visa from the British in India, in Iran. He thinks everything is going to be okay. He has a ticket on the SS General Gordon, which is going from San Francisco, for, uh, to San Francisco from Bombay, this is pre Pearl Harbor. Um, and he thinks that um, he's going to arrive, uh, and he never does, or he does uh, in uh, the fall of 1946, um, but not in May 1941. Um, as it turns out, it's a particularly unlucky convergence of the personal and the political, because he passes the border, now Pakistan and Quetta, just a couple of weeks before the British are planning to move into Iran, and therefore anybody with a, with a, with a German passport, even one marked with a J, or as you saw here, with a big <coughs> is automatically suspect as a so-called fifth columnist. They are terribly worried about infiltration uh, from anyone who might be um, an enemy agent. And so he is immediately jailed. And I just want to quote uh, for from, from uh, something that he wrote uh, in a letter about his experience being initially jailed because it again, it speaks to this paradox that I'm really trying to think about of being a refugee and being a European. Because he says, I was for 20 days 
the only European prisoner in the Kveta district jail. With a whole jail hospital at my disposal, with two servants and a cook, specially engaged for preparing my meals because he couldn't be allowed, even as a prisoner, to be kept with the general Indian prison population. So he's horrified, frustrated, hardly grateful for this. The poor cook prepared the most awful stuff. Um, he submits, subsisted on liquid milk and soda water and one penguin book a day, which was led to him by the Muslim deputy uh, superintendent. So he ends up being interned. Numerous of his fellow refugees were initially interned, then re-interned in 1941, slowly released. But you see, people are allowed in. Uh, the Jewish Relief Agency had asked the chemists. Here is a certificate of identity that allows a chemist um, to, enter, to enter the country. Again, some of them, these are photographs from a home in Madras. Some of them are able to live very comfortably, and some are unlucky enough, and these are the initial lists, um, to be put into internment camps uh, by, run by the British. This happens all over, of course, in the UK, but all over the British Empire, as enemy aliens, or even, in this case, um, as a suspected enemy agent. As you say, a merchant reported to have been trading with Germany while in Persia. And that was what happens from working in the bazaar. You're suspected of uh, being an enemy agent. And then comes a life <coughs> which we can talk about uh, more in a QA and a uh, of what it means, again, to be a European refugee internee in a camp behind barbed wire, and yet still have <coughs> certain privileges of still being served, for example, by Indians and getting your food served on um, tables uh, that have cloth on them, for example. And if you just look, it's very, again, the sort of everydayness of being an internee, an artifact from the prison library in um, Dehradun prison uh, internment camp. I think he's thinking about returning to the bazaar. So he's keeping pages of unusual saris that maybe he could make a living from once he's released. But at the same time, from the picture post in Britain, uh, in the internment camp, an article by uh, a British officer, Edward Thompson, the father of the famous social historian E.P. Thompson, that already at the time says, we leave the vital problem of India unsolved. We're keeping her people's leaders in prison. We are failing to give the colony the benefits of the Atlantic Charter. So here, too, come, you see this coming together right, of the fate of the refugees with the progress of the anti-colonial struggle and Britain's effort to keep it all under control. In the meantime, these refugees are stuck. right? They're in prison in this wonderful camp for fools. We want to leave you with all your bloody rules. <coughs> we ask from you, Maxwell, the commander, the keys, as we want to enjoy release. Oh, dear adieu, we want to leave you soon. Uh, eventually, he ends up in a much better family camp up in the hill station, Puhanda, where life is better. Above all, there are women, which is um, a privilege that had not been afforded uh, in uh, the previous internment camp. And he actually <coughs> constructs for himself a little badge uh, that speaks to, I think, this hybridity of identities of being a Jew. This was done, I think, after the war, as the news of what had happened in Europe closes in. He calls himself a POW, which is not strictly correct. <coughs> he puts in the Star of David that Jews were forced to wear, of course, uh, under, under Nazi occupation. Uh, he puts in his nickname. He puts in his degree that he was a doctor of laws. And then on the back, he lists all the different prisons and camps in which he was interned and makes sure that we understand that this all happened in British India, 
the empire that he and all the other refugees in India wanted nothing more than to serve themselves. But they have been, as he says, we, he said in a 1943 Rosh Hashanah sermon in the internment camp, he said, he, he talks about remembering our fathers and mothers who instead of enjoying a life full of quiet and happiness, either put their life to an end themselves or fell victim to murder. We remember all of them. We remember the, uh, the Jewish and non-Jewish soldiers who have died in all five parts of the world fighting for humanity and freedom. And he says, we are here contrary to our hopes and wishes. And we are able to do little so that their death can be avenged. And that message gets repeated for the next two Rosh Hashanah sermons uh, that, he, uh, that he will give, even as he is writing about the pleasures and indignities, as everything was always on carbon paper, of, uh, of being in the Orient, of dreaming about life in Europe, everything from being able to sleep under a blanket, not having to sleep under a mosquito nest, going to a symphony orchestra again, and eating gooseberry tart and whipped cream, uh, while admitting that in a certain sense, even living in a British internment camp was a kind of paradise uh, compared to what he would have experienced and what he by then was aware that his family uh, left behind was experiencing uh, in Germany. And he says, again, this is not the paradise I want to be in. I would much rather uh, be fighting. Uh, those requests are, for the most part, constantly uh, refused. Ultimately, when he is released, joins the work, very important work, of the Jewish Relief Association uh, in Bombay, discovers then the sort of dangers and pleasures of a colonial city that is in the midst of trying to liberate itself, where increasingly one sees the violence um, that will come with partition and with the anti-imperial struggle, where he starts to understand this is a British uh, guy that tells their soldiers to watch out for germs, uh, and also how to uh, not insult women and um, how to behave properly. Uh, but he is starting to understand that this is a world in which, contrary to what he thought, there were racial and ethnic tensions <coughs> that were violent and that were threatening to explode that were not about Germans and Jews, not about so-called Aryans and non-Aryans, but in fact, in this case, on the one hand against the British, and on the other hand, increasingly between Muslims and Hindus. So that uh, the, the, the goal becomes, and I'm almost done with the story, because almost all of the refugees will want to leave. They do want to go someplace that is, in their mind, Western, as long as it is not repatriation uh, to Europe. Uh, and certainly not to Germany. Uh, so this becomes a time of trying to go from consulate to consulate, of trying to get new visas, but at the same time working with the relief organizations, with the JDC, with the Jewish agency. And also, as you see here with this quote from Nehru, uh, with local Indian Jews, Indian nationalists, uh, and uh, other refugees to help their brethren back in Europe. So ironically, the relief work starts going in the other direction. This is a statement from uh, actually a Muslim Maharaja who had set up a um, shelter for Polish refugee children um, on his princely estate. Uh, again, uh, a correspondence with the World Jewish Congress in London, again much more to say about that. So this is an extremely contradictory, ambivalent world filled, as I say, with the trauma of what was lost, the increasing knowledge that drips in piece by piece of what had happened, 
and still this adventure of trying to <coughs> discover the exotic, this back to the motions, back thinking, I'm going to be released, I'm not going to be released, I'm tired of being a transitist, I don't want to be a displaced person by profession, I would very much like to get rid of all these honorable titles and to start anew, something more reasonable, permanent, promising, and decent, uh, even as the violence of what will become partition becomes more urgent and he becomes more and more uh, desperate uh, to leave, uh, which ultimately in his case happens uh, in the fall of 1946. Uh, this is the menu, it's actually from another ship, but the menu of the terrible British food served on uh, a converted food ship where you see the transition from being a refugee to going to a new home and in between that limbo of being in transit, uh, which he finally achieves uh, with much difficulty, with help from the World Jewish Congress, the Jewish Relief Association. And finally, and here we go to the end of the story, uh, finally, uh, at the end of August 1946, um, he gets on the same ship, but five years later, um, it costs much more, he, uh, it, it costs much less, actually, he ironically notes, because now it's just a converted troop ship. Um, drinking his first Coca-Cola on the ship, uh, playing poker, passing the Bay of Manila, and finally, in September, a real landmark, the first use of woolen, woolen trousers, pillows, and woolen blankets, and finally, this long-awaited day uh, when the ship will uh, dock in San Francisco, and he is on his way cross-country to Hartford, Connecticut, uh, to meet with his brother, and in an indication <coughs> of this hybridity that did accompany the rising standard of European We do have time for um, Q&A, so if you have questions, I'll bring you the microphone because we are recording. Um, so please, the floor is open. Yes, in the back. <laughs> I can, I'm loud enough, it's okay. When you were telling this, I was just seeing the parallels with the, with the ghetto in Shanghai. Yeah. And in terms of it, it sounds like it was a more affluent group uh, versus the one in Shanghai, but in Shanghai they set up schools. And do you want to maybe talk about the parallels? Yeah, a little bit? Uh, 
I mean, you have Russians, you have Baghdadi Jews, uh, you have uh, certainly not just Chinese. But that's what I was talking about when I, I mentioned this quote, imperial turn, if you will, in um, Holocaust studies, that we now have graduate students and young scholars who are, there's a young woman named Kimberly Chang, actually at um, NYU, there's uh, someone doing this for India, Pragya Kal, uh, in, um, at the University of Michigan, who are starting to turn the gaze around, okay, and who are trying to understand what was that experience like from the point of view of the locals? Because most of the memoirs we have and the stories we have and the memorabilia and the letters come from the refugees. Some of that is a language problem. So increasingly now, we have students who will speak Chinese or Bengali or Hindi uh, or Farsi who can look from, from the other direction. Uh, so. Uh, I would say that the Central European refugees in Iran and India arrived, those who arrived in the 30s are able to bring more, they bring their lifts, uh, and which those who go to Shanghai are no longer able to do. On the other hand, the Polish Jews who traveled relatively quickly in transit through Iran and sometimes also through India are completely impoverished, right? So, uh, these, these are different stories uh, under different conditions, but what they share is this tension between Europeans and locals and the strange kind of in-between position that refugee Jews occupy. And what they also share is that once the war ends and Western control uh, is, is no longer assured, whether it is after the end of the war, the Americans were actually in the Shanghai before the revolution, but are then in the war, whether it is Iran once the British and the Soviets were involved, um, or whether it's India with the end of British rule, it's at that moment that the European refugee Jews feel like they need to leave, even though they may be very sympathetic in the case of India to the anti colonial struggle in the case of China, even to the revolutionary struggle. But this is not the place that they want to stay. They want to be someplace that feels more Western, and they want to be, a, uh, they want to be someplace that uh, is safe. Another question here. So I, I can't help but observe what a, a, a mixed group we are, because there's somebody who's retired.
effectively not to, not to Palestine or Israel. They go either to Australia or to, uh, uh, or in many cases, to, to England. Uh, so it, I think it just speaks, I, it, it's a, I could say a lot more, but I think, again, it speaks to the sort of very complicated in between status and also the complicated relationship with European Jews. The, the main Baghdadi synagogue in, in Bombay at the time, which was then called the Fort Synagogue, which was in the, Europe, the quote, European part of town, that was actually used for Ashkenazi services um, in the 1940s. Um, so those, were, those services were, were, were shared and, and went back and forth. Uh, and uh, actually, again, have this sort of you know, kind of extraordinary description of a funeral for the head of the Jewish Relief Association, who had died unexpectedly, relatively young. And there's a huge memorial service in the Fort Synagogue. Uh, it still exists. You can still go and visit it. Uh, and, um, and, and, and there were 400 European Jews in Ashkenazi <coughs> service led by, and here you see how complicated it gets, led by the British Army chaplain who, who annoyed some of the German Jewish refugees because he, was, he had a, quote, cockney accent. <laughs> uh, so it, 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 you know, this becomes a multicultural world, not just in general, but for, 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 the, for the Jews as well. But the Baghdadi Jews were very important in the relief agents, in the relief work. And they're also important in those contact, as we saw here with Nehru and also with Gandhi, um, as they ironically start to collect money for the Jewish refugees and displaced persons in Europe. So the aid starts going the other way. Uh, and the world, you know, there's some really crazy correspondence you see uh, from the World Jewish Congress to some of these leaders that say, you know, who's the money? Where's the money? And they said, we're not doing anything unless we clear it <coughs> with, uh, with, with, with that money. And they get those statements of support. Yes. Oh, yes. yes. Um, so, so, first of all, thank you um, for coming here and sharing your story. That makes it cool. Um, and, um, my question um, to you, Dr. Rusty, is um, I can't hear. Sorry. Um, my question to you, Dr. Grossman, is um, can you elaborate on um, how you collected some of the um, the pictures in your slides? So I'm, I'm going to assume the family um, photos are from your family. But um, what about um, the other images? So, for example, the um, you know the passport or the um, the record that indicated why your father was in terms, you know, did, did your father no. hold on to those, no, 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 or? No, no. That's one of the, that's one of the, the, the pleasures of the, uh, you know, time consuming uh, parts of doing research, uh, and the kind of surprise when you discovered that the stories that you heard as anecdotes when you were growing up, and thought, oh, these are just some tales that my, you know, parents are telling me when they actually turn out to be documented in archival records uh, that uh, are, in this case, those lists are from the British Library uh, and from the quote unquote, it used to be called actually, the, the India office files. And uh, so the, 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 the archival material is a great question. Thank you for asking. It's every historian's question. Um, so the, the sources are extremely mixed. Okay. The archival material comes uh, primarily from the German Foreign Office, okay. which kept until they were thrown out uh, in the summer of 1941 by the invasion uh, by the Soviets in the north and the British uh, from the south. Uh, they kept records on every single German national that they could find who showed up in their mission asking for passports to be removed. That included Jews. And one of the things that's interesting is that when Jews showed up, 
They marked them as Jews. They sent a note back to Berlin, to the local Gestapo, saying, is there any reason why we shouldn't renew this person's passport? And invariably, the answer would come back saying, no, it's fine, <coughs> renew their passport, just make it with a proviso that they cannot return. And this is one of the things where I always say, it's so much better and increasingly, unfortunately for your generation, it will be less and less possible to actually go to the archive and not just look at the digital material, because the papers from the German mission in Taiwan, which were rescued under very difficult circumstances, and not all of them were, some of them were destroyed and burned before the invasion or as the invasion was happening. You know, they're falling apart, they're in terrible condition. And then the letters from the Gestapo, they're kind of thick paper, you know, red, red, you know, the swastika in perfect condition. They will last forever. You will not, you can't tell that from the digital version. So that's one source. And, and we see that there's actually quite a lot of information. They don't capture everybody. My mother, again, somehow always managed to see on the radar. My father is very well documented, and many other people that I know are there. That's one source. The British, the British records are stunning. The you know, historians who write about any part of the British Empire are very, very lucky because not only do they keep very careful records, but every British consulate, whether it's in Isfahan or whether it's in Mashhad, has someone known as a political resident. And that political resident keeps a daily diary that reports on everything. Every person who comes through, they even tell me exactly the dates, for example, in my father's case, that he passed through and they thought, it's fine, he's on his way, he's in the desert. But they also report on the locals that they are uh, working with on the, uh, uh, the local Iranian, and you hear the colonial language, the sort of bemused contempt uh, with which they describe people, whether or not they're good at trying to stop, whether they're willing to have a drink with them, right? Those kind of points. So, um, British writing is incredible. Then, if you go to the National Archives in Washington, you can go through all of the records of the Americans in Iran. So those quotes that gave about the post awful Holocaust yeah. and the American comments on the arrival of the Polish refugees, that's all from the American uh, mission in Tehran, and then later also from the military command. So, there, and then there are people, not me, um, because I don't have those languages, but uh, there are, of course, Soviet records. Uh, and for the Tehran children, there's just a new check, which is a memoir. Um, but you can see that there's also quite a lot of material for the, for the Tehran children who then go to Palestine. There's quite a lot of material on that to be found in Israel, um, particularly also in the archives of the ghetto fighters house, actually. Uh, so the photographs are um, either you know, scans that I took from the archives, or their family photos, um, or uh, in some cases, uh, the family camp, camp, or the photograph of the, the postcards. Mm -hmm. Those are from the United States Monument Memorial Museum. And you're right, um, I, what I should do um, is I should, as a good historian, but I'm so bad at PowerPoint and I'm um, I should have uh, the exact source of the following of my slide. Uh, which I uh, will do. Very good question. So we'll take one one last question, and then there is a reception afterwards. So for those of you who have stayed, please join us for reception afterwards. Thanks. I have a, just a very brief comment, and we can all go and have a reception. Um, but I spent the first four years of my life in freedom now, oh. but I haven't, I haven't heard anyone mention that for a long time. Um, and I had a family member, <coughs> excuse me, who spent 13 years in the Shanghai ghetto. And about the time that that documentary came out, I was going to be traveling in China and going to Shanghai. And I said to her, um, would you like me to go to the street where you live, take a picture of the house? And 
And she, she looked at me, hesitated slightly, and said, you know, I, I've had enough memories of Ashley about that. I don't really want to know any more about it. And I, it struck me then and later, so the death, that she, she never talked about it for years in Shanghai. I knew in general that they had, they had been less well fed as the war went on and so on. But, but in, I mean, on the one hand, it, it saved her life. On the other hand, it wasn't an easy time. 